Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Let's all stand together. I forgot to point out that this is all of these singers are, are part of our hyphen ministry, which is our young adult uh, college age ministry. Didn't they do a great job? Amen. We love them all. We're proud of all of them. I think. And I just speak for myself. I think one of the most difficult, uh, most difficult uh, things a person can do, looking back over the whole of their life, is in their in their college years, hold tightly to their faith and hold tightly to their Christian devotion. Um, it's it's it. it <laughs> You guys know what I'm saying, and we are so proud of our hyphen ministry. These, pe these, young, these young people love God. They're not playing games. They are serious. They're dedicating their heart to God. Let's give them one more hand. <clears throat> Amen. I'm going to get right into the word of the Lord, but I want us to pray before we start. Pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, we open our hearts to you. We ask that you would speak to us. We ask that your anointing would touch the parts of our heart and soul that too often times we hide from you. Lord Jesus, we want to be vulnerable in your presence today. We want to open ourselves to receive what you would speak to us. Let your power and your anointing be very real in this house today that we might be changed by your Holy Spirit to become more like you, to become useful for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Somebody say, in Jesus' name. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, we are experiencing the first cool Sunday morning of the fall, and I don't know about you, but he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Uh, uh, following the storm, I walked outside this morning, and it was like all of the creation was right there to give me a hug and a kiss and say I was going to make it. And I'm so glad for, uh, the great thing about living in the South is that we get four beautiful seasons, not just one or two. We get four beautiful seasons, and uh, which reminds me of a joke. You ever, you ever hear the joke about the $10,000 telephone? This traveling salesman was going to church all across America, and he went into churches all over the place. They had a golden telephone, and uh, it said uh, the $10,000 telephone um, you make a call, it costs you $10,000. He asked, why does it cost $10,000 to make a call, a call on a golden telephone? And the man said, he was told in all these churches, well, that's a direct line to God. And if you pick up the golden telephone, pay your $10,000, you get a direct line to God. Well, not too many people were making calls direct to God because $10,000 isn't no joke. Finally, his job brought him down into the south, and he came into a, a southern church. And uh, he saw a golden telephone, and it said, one dollar. Well, th he was surprised by that. And he said, a golden telephone, what is this? The guy said, the pastor said, direct line to God. He said, how can it be only one dollar here in the south, and it's $10,000 everyone, everywhere else? And the pastor said, well, in the south, uh, direct line to God's a local call. And so we have four beautiful seasons, and uh, I, I like it. Now, some of you guys miss, you came from, you know, the desolate wastelands of some cold, bitter place, and you still miss that. Uh, God bless you. Uh, you too can be saved. His mercy <laughs> endureth forever. No, we 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 so thankful. Uh, for uh, all the blessings of God in our life. This is Labor Day weekend, which is always interesting because it's the last gasp of summer vacation. Everybody who gets to the end of the summer and they look at their bank account and they still have some money, they're like, honey, let's hit the road. And so there go. And uh, most of us stay, especially if you have children in school, it makes it tough to leave. I'd be glad to go this weekend myself, but I have children in school and that kind of puts the kibosh on that. Labor Day weekend, we celebrate as a nation uh, the, the, the rights of labor in America. It seems like a small thing to us because we grew up in a culture 
where you have a lot of labor rights. You, can, you have to be treated a certain way, but I want you to be reminded it wasn't always that way. Uh, as a uh, part of history, of particularly of, of not just the Western world, but the whole world, uh, there were times when people had to work 60, 70, 80 hour weeks, no prescribed um, rest time, no, terrible working conditions. And so we, having made a lot of accomplishments, starting at the end of the 19th century, we picked a day as a nation, and we said, it's going to be Labor Day, and this is going to be to celebrate all the working people of America. Now, most of you guys are on trust funds. You're trust fund babies, and you spend most of your life pretty much drinking coffee and taking naps. But uh, so a few of us have to actually work, and this is your weekend. If you work hard, this is your weekend. Uh, elbow your neighbor and say, thank God, finally. It's my weekend. Labor. Uh, we, all of us, are supposed to catch up on our rest uh, in this weekend. So if you're not resting this weekend, uh, well, I don't know, you're doing something wrong. Uh, one of my favorite scriptures is found in Psalms 23, and you, most of us could quote this, uh, starting at verse number one, the Lord is my shepherd, say it with me if you know it, I shall not want... He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and what? And what? Stop. One of my favorite scriptures in the word of the Lord is that last scripture, verse 3 of Psalms 23. He restoreth my soul. Let me tell you a truth about living. Uh, we need restoration. Can I get a better amen than that? We need restoration. Wear and tear is part of the journey. Wear and tear is part of the week. It's not a particularly unique thing for you to have wear and tear. It is an ordinary thing for you to have wear and tear throughout your week. It happens to us physically. None of us are getting any younger. Time is funny that way. Uh, you jump out of the bed, you nearly lose your balance, and that's never happened before. You get home and your hip is hurting. Really? My hip? Who thought that was a good idea? This goes on and on. Time is pushing us in one direction and wear and tear is real, physically real, psychologically real, emotionally real. And let me say it most importantly, spiritually, it is real and we must be restored. If you find people who know how to restore a particular thing, they can make it look almost better than new. Uh, one of the great stories of restoration came out of the last steam locomotives that were used in the 1940s. Uh, some of the, the, the most famous ones, the, the pinnacle of the craft, you might say, of building steam locomotives was built in the 40s by a railroad company that you will not remember the name of, Norfolk and Western, based in Norfolk, Virginia. They designed and built their own Class J uh, steam locomotive and they are beautiful they're like a streamlined bullet and what's interesting is this company made their own locomotives most com com companies did not and so there were whole generations of people in that Norfolk Virginia area who had worked on locomotives they had designed it there were whole families that had three and four generations of people who at some point in their life had worked on serviced uh, oper operated design or built steam locomotives and a few years back, there's actually the story's told in the little magazine called Country. Some of you guys get it. It's a real sentimental little magazine. Uh, sometimes if you get tired of Facebooking, look at Country Magazine. It's the total opposite direction. <laughs> Uh, they told about taking one of these locomotives, and the community had such a history with steam locomotives, they decided, uh, with some funding but a lot of volunteers, they decided to restore one. So they found this Class J locomotive, and they assembled all of the talent, people who had generations in their family who had worked on these steam locomotives at different phases of their development, different models. And starting in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, they started restoring one of these J-Class uh, locomotives, and after they had donated literally hundreds of thousands of volunteer hours, after they had had technicians go in and refinish everything, re, re um, attach everything, uh, make parts that hadn't been made in years, they rebuilt and finished to this beautiful classic 
uh, condition, pristine condition, one of these J-class locomotives. And then for the first time, they had it on the tracks and they were taking it on the celebratory, the very first one, the inaugural trip. And there were literally thousands of people from Norfolk, Virginia, who had family who had worked on these things and came out and lined the rails. And they filled up the train with the volunteers, people who had worked on these, restoring these, this engine, restoring these cars. And uh, they did their first run with it. It's beautiful. It's the peak of uh, uh, steam locomotive technology. Uh, it's still there. You actually can go up and ride it now. Uh, but they actually talked to people. The j- journalists talked to the people who had volunteered. And there was one man who told the story about how his family had been involved in this. He is also a technician. And he said that his father had been involved. He said, this is afterwards, after they're interviewing. He said, my father was involved in designing this. This, not just the locomotive as a whole class, but this, ex- this very one. He was involved with it. And he said, when I first started volunteering to go and restore this locomotive, he said, I would go, I would walk up to the locomotive and I would find where it would be a natural place for someone to lean against it or someone to put their hands on something. He said, and I'd walk up to it and I just would put my hand on it and I would remind myself that my father had rested against this locomotive in the same way I was. Or my father had sat right here. He said it was a connection back to my family's history. And that's just an inanimate object. It's just a piece of machinery. Uh, And if you can find someone who knows how it was designed, they were there and they know the reason why this widget does that and that widget does this. If you can find somebody who knows what they're doing, they can take it and they can restore it and when they're done it shines a little bit more bright than it ever did the first time it's a it's cleaner the second time than it ever was the first time you know when you first make something it's not special yet but when you restore it it is special it's more beautiful the second time than it was the first time the second time they do it they paint parts of it that before they they weren't painted the second time they do it they polish parts of it that weren't polished the first time they built it they make it more beautiful than ever let me tell you of a spiritual truth that the great psalmist David would like you to know he restores your soul he didn't just make you when you were from your mother's womb yes he is your creator but his work with you is not done just when he's created you you can find a beautiful baby and that baby seems so innocent and you play with that baby I'm blessed right now and I try to remind myself every remind myself every day I'm blessed to have a two-year-old in my house. Now, some of you think, I don't want a two-year-old in your house. Well, if your two-year-old was as sweet as my two-year-old, you would want a two-year-old in your house. Uh, and so, it, it's so a, a person's soul is never more beautiful than when they're young. They haven't been hurt yet. They haven't been, they haven't been broken yet. They haven't been disappointed. They find joy in everything. They can make a game out of something simple. You take them outside, they sing and dance in the morning sunshine while the rest of us grumble over our coffee. Their joy is never so pure as when they're young and they're fresh and their souls are pure. That is innocence. And when you hold your child, you can feel their innocence. Even, even in all of their heart high maintenance ways their innocence feels beautiful to your soul that is in much need of restoration and you play with that child and you feel the essential goodness of them and you feel the joy and you feel the wonder and if you're at all reflective some of us aren't but some of us are if you are at all reflective you will wonder if you ever felt as much joy as that child is feeling right now you'll watch that child fall out on the couch and take a nap and you'll think to your yourself I don't think I have ever been as comfortable as that child is right now you'll see that child playing with a toy and you'll say I don't know if I've ever felt as much joy because now hear me my friend my brother my sister now in the journey with a heavy pack upon your back in the journey your soul feels like it has never been as pure as that child's soul and in your disappointment and yes your ego and not all of our not all of the elements of who we are are beautiful can I have an amen in our competition in our resistance one to one another in our self-pity and all of the things that make us selfish narcissistic Americans all of those things put a 
darkening upon our soul, a heaviness upon our soul, soul, and a joylessness within our soul. And we look at the child and we feel to ourselves, I don't know if I've ever been as pure as that child was. Let me tell you, you were one day. That's how your mama and your daddy looked at you and they thought. But now you're a heavy journeyer. Now your feet are tired and your back is sore. I want to tell you something about your creator. He wasn't just there with you at your beginning. He's with you all the way home. If you're in the heavy years of your life, if you're in the middle years of your journey, you need to hear a preacher today and remind yourself he's not just the one who made you and he's not just the one who's taken you home. Along the way, he wants to restore your soul. <coughs> Excuse me. He wants to restore your soul. Gives us this image, he restoreth our soul. Modern life has changed our experience the communications of our time and our day <clears throat> fill us with a drowning it almost seems as though we're drowning in a a, a, a river of misery and violence uh, any news source that you choose to frequent will fill your news stream with a non-stop river of violence spite competition violence and it never seems to end there comes a time when all of us no matter how much self-discipline you seek to place within your journey there comes a time when all of us need to find peaceful spiritual renewal can I have an amen we must be restored we must be renewed there must be some spiritual renovation that goes on in our heart there must be some spiritual renewal that happens in our soul uh, we as Christian people, as religious people, we use the word soul a lot. It's not used much in secular society, but we understand what we mean by it. But let me, let me define it and bring it to your consideration in the follow, following way. Your soul is this part of you. That is your soul. Uh, where you hurt the most, it will be within your soul. Where the joy is the sweetest, that will be your soul. Where the pain is the most intense, that will be your soul. And the oppression that comes against is what will destroy your faith in the promises of God. And the weight that you carry within your soul will be what takes the praise from your lips. It'll be what stops your prayer life. The weariness within your soul, it will be what stops the joy with which you want saying praise to the Most High King. We can mar, we can weigh, we can damage, we can trouble our soul. We can cast down our soul. And when we get to that point where there only the only solution is for us to find a renovation, a renewal, a restoration of our soul. What you need at that moment is the presence of God in your life. Sometimes you can take a vacation and it helps. Sometimes you can take a day off and it helps. I'm not against vacation. I certainly am not against taking a day off. Amen. Sometimes you need rest. But have you ever gone on a vacation and come back heavier than when you left? Come on, let's get real. <clears throat> uh, I, I've gone on vacation. In fact, this last little trip I came on, I came home heavier than when I left. I came home thinking I needed a vacation. And I was praying about it, and the Lord told me I'd just been on vacation. Our, there can be a heaviness within our soul. There can be a weariness within us. We must be restored in our soul. The good news is God's presence is the single most powerful thing you will ever experience in your life for the renewal of your soul. Lean over your neighbor say, he's talking to you right now. Let me say it again. The presence of God is the most powerful thing you will ever experience in restoring your soul. <clears throat> Since we're getting real here for a moment, let me, let me get really real, okay? Uh, whenever I do that, you think I'm about to make some personal mission because I normally do. Okay, so that's when my wife hit me, and so that's my personal omission. No. <laughs> um, in modern times, <clears throat> we try to renew ourselves with entertainment. 
don't rush past this. Come on, slow your roll. Think about this for a moment. You try to renew yourself with entertainment. This is the modern way. We have heaviness in our life. We have weariness in our soul. We're tired. We've lost the high praise that would flow from our heart to God. We've lost the faith wherewith we could hear a prayer request and pray and speak faith into that prayer request. We're heavy. We're tired. We're weary. Maybe you're in the middle years of your journey. Your career didn't work out the way you thought it would. And it's now like one of Pharaoh's chariots driving heavily (laughs) along the, the Red Sea. And you, here you are. <clears throat> Nothing's really worked out the way you thought it was. You thought your education that some of you still are paying debt on. You're still paying payments on your education. You thought it would work out differently, but no doors were open there. And your career path actually, <clears throat> your career path actually is taking you in the opposite direction. And when you send that payment in every month, you wonder why did I even get this education? Everything else in your life can go wrong. And you can clear bankruptcy and start over except for them student loans. And no bankruptcy getting from that. You're stuck with Uncle Sam. Here we are. It didn't work out the way. Some of you guys are in relationships. And you right now, you wouldn't admit it because you're so righteous on Sundays you can hardly stand yourself. But you're worried right now whether or not your relationship's going to make it. You worry. Come on, let's get as real as we can get, all right? You don't even know if this time next year you'll still be married. Or you don't even know whether or not your relationships are at a point where you're just pretty much done, ready to quit talking to each other. And here you are. And you know how heavy the road is. And you know how tired the effort is. And you wonder, you wonder how it's all going, all going to work out. And in our heaviness, we stagger home at the end of the day and we flop down. And we figure out which, you know, uh, microwave dinner we're going to (laughs) eat. And we're sitting here and we're tired and we say, man, I need a break. I think I will do something fun. And so whether or not it is a movie, whether or not it is some show you like, whether or not it is a book you like to read, whether or not it is the entertainments of our time, we think entertainment is what renews us. That's what we think. But entertainment doesn't renew us. It's just a different form of stress. Oh, it's quiet in the house. That's a kind of uh, compliment to a preacher when it gets really quiet. Uh, We think entertainment is what renews us. And so you get your favorite novel or you, whatever it is you do for entertainment, You think, and then what do you do? You go and you watch a show about someone who's trying to... Or you watch a guy who's running from zombies. Really, zombies? And they're like, And you're like, oh, man. Got to get some Doritos. And you think because you have got your heaviness... You are restored until the entertainment's over. And you go to lay down in your bed and you find yourself just as heavy as you were. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody. Or I'm, I make a couple of you nervous, but I don't even care. I've been doing that for years. You wonder why you're not restored when you get done with your two hours of Hollywood. You wonder why you're not restored when you get done with your favorite novel. And here, aliens were trying to kill the guy the whole time. And zombies were chasing him out of the corner. Or, his, uh, or her, 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 her husband was trying to kill her. Or what, uh, she had her and killed his mom. Now she's going to kill him. And you're sitting there. <laughs> and you get done with your entertainment. And it was fun. And you lived another life. That's what entertainment does. It lets you live another life. Okay. You live someone else's story. And you wonder why you're not restored. I'm going to tell you this. If you hear nothing else I say, I hope you get this because this is prior and put it together right now. Entertainment, it is fine as long as it's good entertainment. Uh, you, you, you have to judge that in your life because I'm not coming to your house to police you. You ain't 12. All right. I'll police my kids. Anyway, moving along. You have to decide that. Entertainment's fine. I enjoy getting on the back of a horse. Just like my dad always says, get out Brother Louie and let him tell you about a man on a horse, okay? Moving along. You guys don't even know what I'm talking about. Young people are like, really? You just dated yourself. Okay, here's what I'm trying to say. After all your entertainment's done, if you think that was your refreshing, uh, don't be surprised when you're just as heavy. 
Because all you did is replace the stress that does matter with the kind of stress that doesn't matter. And when it's all done, you're still stressed. Let me tell you how to restore your soul. You need to get in the presence of God. Let me tell you how to restore your soul. You need to turn down the volume in your life, not turn it up. Let me tell you how to restore your soul. You need to quit thinking entertainment is restoration. Entertainment is not restoration. Entertainment is not renewal. I am renewed in the presence of God. I we would do a lot better to sit down. You know, back, back we have this ideal of, of, of some of the people of uh, have gone generation before us. And you, you see the man, he's, he's ran his tractor all day long. And he comes home, he has a fine dinner. And he goes out and sits down on his porch. And he sits there and drinks a glass of iced tea. And his dog sits there uh, beside the chair. And he just sits there and looks back across his fields. And you think to yourself, my God, if my life was only like that, everything would be better. Okay, at least that individual is taking time to reflect. At least that individual is making space in their life. Not just jumble, jumble, jumble. Not just Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. Not just news, 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 entertainment, entertainment, Hollywood, Hollywood, Hollywood. None of, they at least are making space in their life to reflect. We need to learn, oh my brothers and sisters, how stress just are, how, how, how stressful is your journey? Let's get, let's be honest here. How stressful is it? You need to move where your soul can breathe. You need to make some time in your life for the presence of God, where you can sit down in his presence uh, and just say, it's, it's me, Lord. It's just me, Lord. I want you to know I love you today. I want you to know I, I thank you for what you've done for me today. He restoreth my soul. Really quickly, let me give you some practical stuff here. The first thing that happens to us, the first manner in which the Lord restores our soul is through His Word. The Word of God is real and powerful, and it's the testimony of literally scores of people who had much greater problems than we have, and God was faithful to them, and God was a calm, and the Lord brought them through. You need to get in the Word of the Lord. Can I have an amen? The second thing is you need to make sure you have space in your life for not just prayer that is dutiful, but prayer that is a celebration of the presence of God we can make prayer another duty we can make prayer another box we have to check we can make prayer another item on our to do and we miss the point of prayer the point of prayer is not about the to do list the point of prayer is to be in the presence of God that our soul might be restored Thirdly, God has given us the support of brothers and sisters, fellow believers, fellow Christians in the body of Christ who can help us be strong, help us be restored. Fellowship is powerful. There's a reason why the New Testament church is founded and built around a fellowship. They continually went house to house. Yes, they had public meetings just like we had public meetings, but they went house to house. It's in those quiet places. It's in those moments where we are able to have the openness and spirit vulnerability that is spiritually healthy coming out in things like confessing needs one to another and confessing weaknesses one to another and speaking life one to another and offering encouragement one to another and embracing one another oh I wish I was preaching this in Charlotte then they'd get with me that's a joke I heard a preacher preaching the whole time I was preaching this in my home church they'd be going crazy right now well, he is preaching in his home church <laughs> this is what I want us to see. These three things are just the obvious things that we see that are strengths of restoration to us. The word of the Lord, the power of prayer, which let me define particularly as time in the presence of God, not just... And number three, the support of other brothers and sisters. This is all the basics of restoration. This is a place to start. But you need to find a way to be a person who pursues the presence of God. Because it's in his presence that we are restored. It's in his presence that we are made partakers of his we need the presence of God in our life. Now, this is going to do several things for us, and I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Maybe, maybe 5 to 25 more minutes. Uh, that was a joke, but it may not be. We'll see. Several things happen in the presence of God. 
several things happen. That you see, I think, one of the most powerful and the most beautiful chapters in the word of the Lord is Isaiah 53. Now, I confess to be guilty of this idea of, excuse me, 54, chapter 54. I confess I'm sometimes guilty of this idea of every chapter I'm in is my favorite. But I honestly, that's how it feels at that moment. That's full, that is, that is honest as I can be. Isaiah 54 just blows my mind because it's God's promise to a people who have fallen. It's God's promise to a people who seemingly have lost their way and in our desperate need of restoration. It speaks to me because I've been that person. I am that person. You are that person. We need restoration. He, we are restored by his presence. And so God speaks to the children of Israel through Isaiah and Isaiah 54. And he gives in the form of a 17 verse a psalm of worship and praise to the Lord. And he, it's, a, it's, a, it's a not, it, it, it's from the Lord to the people, not from the people to the Lord. So it's the promises of God to the people. It's written in the form of a song, written in the form of almost like a, a poetic statement. Uh, but it starts with this phrase you will recognize immediately, sing, O barren. Anyone ever felt barren? Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. And then he says this, in the place of your tent, stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. In other words, get ready to grow. The Lord's about to bless you with a bounty of new life. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Get ready to expand to the right and to the left. Grant it, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Don't be afraid. You will not be ashamed. Your descendants will inherit the nations. You won't be ashamed. You won't be disgraced. You will not be put to shame. All the way through this, your maker is your husband. And the Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the holy one of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit. Like a youthful wife when you were refused. Says the Lord, for a mere moment I have forsaken you. But with mercies I will gather you. This whole beautiful song of restoration and in this song there are truths spiritual truths I want to give them to you real quick first of all God's restoration will renew your joy did you hear what I just said God's restoration will renew your joy quiet too long but you're about to break out in a brand new song because you're going to rediscover the joy of the Lord what does a barren soul have to sing over the promises of God that's what they have to sing over when God restores you you burst forth with joy you sing and you say oh my life isn't the kind of life with a lot of singing and joy I tell you today stand on the promises of God and believe restoration is coming for you uh, one of the most uh, I think most celebrated and um, anointed hymn writers of the last few years was Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby wrote so many awesome songs like Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, uh, and on and on she wrote. Uh, she, at a very young age, due to a medical error, due to an error that happened in the, under the care of people who were supposed to make her better, not worse, she lost sight in both her eyes. And she spent all of her life, except for the very early years, she was blind. She had had it. She lost her vision due to a medical error. How can you have joy when you're blind and it was taken from you by somebody else's mistake? How can you have joy when your life is so bad that you need to be careful? for because you are blind. Fanny Crosby did not let that stop her. She became in her life perhaps the greatest hymn writer of all, all modern memory, I would say. And she wrote in Blessed Assurance, this is the lyrics, visions of rapture now burst on my sight, watching and waiting, looking above. How 
my friend, can a blind lady write about visions of rapture bursting on my sight and watching and waiting and looking above because she's not content to live within the reality of her life. She is holding on to the promises of God. And when God restores you, he restores your joy. I don't care how bad you have it. There's somebody who's had it worse. I don't care how difficult your journey is. There's somebody with a more difficult journey. Let the joy of the Lord restore you in your walk. The second thing, real quick, the second thing that will happen to you when God restores you is the influence that you had or once had is going to be expanded by by the blessings of God in your life. And this is why the writer talks about link, uh, lengthen your cord, strengthen your stakes. You're going to be to the right and to the left. Can you trust and believe that tomorrow is going to be better than today? Can you trust and believe that God knows what he's doing in your life? Hear me today. When God restores you, he's going to knock out that wall, and he's going to knock out that wall, and he's going to say, we need some more room around here for blessing. God's restoration will expand the arena of God's gift, God's influence, God's anointing, God's blessing in your life. Number three, God's restoration will remove your shame. Shame is darkens our souls shame destroys our faith i know people who should be in the church but something happened and they were ashamed and they could not imagine that the church would have a culture that would love them in spite of their shame and if we've ever had that culture god forgive us and help us to repent over that and they're not here because shame has made their souls heavy i want to hear i want to remind you Lord will restore your soul and he will remove your shame and verse number four do not be afraid you will not suffer shame do not fear disgrace you will not be humiliated on and on the writer's going to go to remind you of the restoration project God has for your soul God delights in removing your shame in fact, Calvary is about God saying, uh, all your shame, all your error, all your sin, uh, I have a plan. Give it to me. Yeah. Lastly, God's restoration will push back the damage, the destruction, the influence, and the power of the opposing forces of darkness that are in your life. You look down at verse number, the last few verses of this chapter. You hear the Lord say, you're, you're afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted. Behold, will lay your stones with colorful gems, and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stone. Oh, hallelujah. Everything that you have lost, everything that you seem to have had taken from you, it's going to be restored when God restores you. This is a theme that starts as far back as Job and goes all the way through Revelations. At the end of the story, you're not just going to be blessed. You're going to be more blessed than you ever were. You're not just going to be safe. You're going to be more safe than you ever. God is going to restore the years that the canker worm hath eaten. What, what, what's that referring to? Remember, this is an agrarian society. Musicians, you could come. This is an agrarian society. And some years, there were certain insects that would come and they would lay waste to the whole harvest. It wouldn't matter how hard they were matter how carefully they tended their crop when those insects came uh, those canker worms uh, they would destroy the whole of the crop and all of the season would be lost and some of us are living there in our lives we feel like we've lost the whole of a season and I want to tell you right now God's going to remember the years that you have lost in your life God is going to start all of this by restoring your soul somebody needs to believe it here today somebody needs to receive it here today God is going to restore your soul let's all Lord Jesus you see every heart here today 
you know where we are. You know how difficult some of the journey that we are experiencing has, has been. Lord Jesus, I pray right now your spirit would reach down into the life, reach down into the heart. And I'm praying that restoration, where there once was joy, I pray you would bring a, a, a double portion of joy. Where once there was hope, I pray you would bring a restoration of hope. Lord, don't let us be satisfied to stay in some ritualized, formalized uh, uh, habit. Uh, habitual uh, service of you or relationship with you but God let us be restored in our joy in our strength restored in our confidence that we might be used of God that we might be blessed of God that we might be God's people in Jesus name I pray in Jesus name I pray hallelujah out of the chair you're in right now would you come stand around the front we do this every Sunday we, have, we end our service with a prayer service, so if you're a guest here today, please come with us. We won't embarrass you or make a scene out of you or anything like that. Uh, we just all gather here at the front at the end of our, at the end of our, our service, and we're going to pray together. And I, one of the reasons why spiritual restoration is so important is I've noticed this in my own life and in others. It's, it's, it's almost impossible for us to be uh, ministers when we're exhausted and spiritually depleted. Um, if you're spiritually depleted, it makes you a very selfish Christian. Not because you're a bad person. You, you see what I'm saying? Not because you're a bad person. Not because, I mean, you may be a bad person, but that's a different problem. You see what I'm saying? We're, we're all of us in need of mercy. But the reason why it makes us a bad, a bad Christian and a selfish Christian is if you can barely, barely carry your own weight, how are you going to help anybody? What, what, one of the themes that comes through over and over in the Scripture is what does the church do with its weak people? We carry our weak people. We don't kill our weak people. We don't offend our weak people. We don't run our weak people off. That's easy and it's carnal. It's tribal. <laughs> you don't have to be led of the Spirit to do that. Just be tribal. Just be your carnal self. I like people to act like me, think like me, eat like me, vote like me, drink like me. If you don't like it, get out. That's tribal. What does the church do with weak people? We love the fire out of them. Can I get a bigger amen than that? We speak faith to Well, uh, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, if you are barely making it, that's very hard. Because you're going to church hoping someone will speak life to you rather than going to church thinking, I'm going to speak life to somebody. You go to work hoping somebody will pray for your needs rather than going to work looking for somebody's needs you can pray for. So we need restoration to be the church. Amen. We need soulful restoration to be people of faith. We need soulful restoration to be people of joy and hope and spiritual confidence. Lord Jesus, a restoration for your people. Let them in their, in their daily walk, in their, their careers, and their obligations of the week, all the things that are stresses to them. Lord, would you give them enough victory where they can put all that in perspective? Would you give them enough joy to put all that in perspective and not be limited, limited by being self-centered, spiritual narcissists? But God, help us to get beyond ourselves, restored in our soul where we didn't come to get, but we came to give. In Jesus' name I pray, and we thank you for it today. Amen. God bless you all. Remember the announcements. Thank you for worshiping with us. Have a great week. Enjoy your Labor Day. You worked hard. You deserve it. We love you. We'll see you later on this week, Wednesday night, 7.30. Thank you for watching First Church Charlotte.